as is traditional, I will begin with two Shanti mantras. These mantras are from the Taitri Upanishad. Taitri Upanishad is one of the earliest and one of the biggest. And the great commentator Bhagavan Shankara is said to have commented on Brihadaranya Upanishad and Taitri Upanishad at the very start. So his commentary is very elaborate in Taitri Upanishad and Brihadaranya Upanishad. These two mantras which I chant pray that our bodies and minds <coughs> and intellects be fit repositories of the knowledge of Brahman. When we acquire the knowledge of Brahman sometime in this life, in this very life we have to do this, then our bodies and minds should be able to hold them. So our body should be pure. Shariram me vicharsharam jikhwa me madhumattama karanabhyam bhuri vishruvam These are three key lines there. My body should be fit and fine. And my tongue should be sweet. Harshness of speech is counted by the Bhagavan Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita as one of the Asuri Sampat, the demonic quality. Never be harsh in speech. Jihwa me matu mattama. I be sweet tongued and I should hear through my ears continuously elevating thoughts, noble thoughts, thoughts of Brahman. Now we are constantly plugging our ears with, you know, the earphones, <laughs> listening to all kinds of things. So the prayer is, let us be constantly be engaged in listening to and absorbing divine thoughts. This is followed by another prayer, which is a realization of a Rishi called Trishanku, who said, my glory is that of a huge mountain. My spiritual stature is so vast, my glory so profound that it can't be described in words. So the idea is you constantly identify yourself with the divine stature, your divine nature, and know, realize, feel that you are glorious, divine huge. So I'll begin with these two prayers and say a few words. Towards the end of time permit, somebody wanted, many people wanted to know something about the Vivekananda University. If time permits, I will do that. <coughs> know the mantras from the Taitri Upanishad. Om Yas Chanda Samrishabho Vishwarupa Chando Bhyod Chamrita At Sambhuva Samendro Medhaya Aspranotu Amritasya Devadharano Bhuyasam Shariram Me Vicharishanam Jihwa Me Madhu Mattama Karna Abhyam Bhuri Visruvam Brahmana Koshosi Medhaya Pihitaha Shrutam me gopaya Om shanti 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 Aham brikshasya reriva Kirtif prishtam gire riva Urdhva pavitro vajani vasvamritamasmi Dravinagum savarchasam Sumedha amritokshitaha Ititrishankor vedanu vachanam Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat The subject today, this morning, I have titled as Aloneness Beyond Loneliness. I picked it up from a talk by J. Krishnamurti. Many of you would know him as one of the outstanding spiritual geniuses of the modern time. It was very unconventional and most people couldn't quite understand what he was trying to say. But that inability to understand intellectually transported them to a region in which they could feel what he was trying to say. 
I, as a student, I had the occasion to listen to him year after year. He was groomed, as you know, by Anibasant as a Messiah, and he was made the head of an order of star. And he realized that truth is a pastless land, it can't be reached through any organization. So as the head of the order, he called a special meeting. Everybody enthusiastically came there only to find that he dissolved the order as a head <laughs> and moved away. One of his friends told him, Krishna, how could you do this? Then he was wearing a simple pair of chapels. He removed them and said like this. <laughs> Where are you going? I said, I don't know. Then he said, you are coming with me. So that was a very uh, different kind of uh, experience. Once he was talking about uh, meditation, the religious mind, etc., fear, anxiety, so somebody in the audience said, was there and said, Sir, please tell us what you are trying to say, convey. We just can't follow what you are trying to say. Can you just say in a sentence what message you are trying to convey? He was roused and said, the message is, empty your mind to receive the immeasurable. <laughs> I remember that still sentence reverberating in my heart. Empty your mind to receive the immeasurable. All of us feel lonely sometimes. And the remedy for loneliness is aloneness. To feel lonely means that you long for company, you want to be loved by somebody else, and you want people should call you and say, how deeply I love you, you don't know, I miss you. We want to be missed by people. Our ego is pampered by that. Nobody misses anybody. That's the way we talk. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda said very powerfully, religions of the world have become lifeless mockeries. What we now need is character. Such a character which is one of boundless love, where every word will tell like thunderbolt. So why is it that we feel lonely? Let's analyze this. As I repeatedly am fond of saying, Vedanta is not a philosophy, it is not metaphysics, it is not religion, it is not theology. It is just investigation into your daily experience. What we are, why we are here, our emotions, our feelings, our thoughts, analyze them. Find out what is the uh, deeper meaning of life itself. Suppose you say, why should we analyze? I'm quite happy without it. Please go ahead. Vedanta is not for you. Your time has not come. Unfortunately, when you are awakened by the blows in life, you'll come crying to Vedanta. But let us start before the shock treatments by nature begins. Wise people begin by seeing the sufferings of others. You don't have to suffer yourself. So you see around, so much of sorrow is in this world. People are feeling lonely, feel desolate, unhappy. Now let us take this one feeling of loneliness which every one of us feels and ask, what is loneliness? Why we are feeling lonely? Lonely means companyless. I have no company. I am alone. I, nobody is there to take care of me. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Lack of company is what you call lonely. Company of whom, what? Of somebody else. Of course we are in our own company, aren't we? Somebody said, I am going to the Himalayas for a pilgrimage. Do you, are you taking any companions? No, I am going alone. Are you taking yourself with you? This question has no meaning because you have to take yourself, which is your body, your mind, your intellect, your emotions, all the samskaras, as we call in Vedanta. You take the whole bundle with you, all the karma. 
And unfortunately, we carry the luggage of karma on our head. Ramana Maharshi, the great saint, southern part of India, he was also an outstanding spiritual genius of the modern time. <coughs> he once told a story of a man who was traveling by train in India and carrying a huge luggage on his head. He was sweating, his head was paining. Somebody said, why are you carrying it in your head? Oh, I told my wife repeatedly, don't give me such a huge luggage, I can't carry it. So why didn't you put it down on the train? It's my luggage, how can I put it down? So the train which is carrying you will carry your luggage also. Karma is what we carry on our heads, in our hearts. The great Lord, if you believe in one, the Mahashakti, the power which has brought you into existence, will carry your karma also. And sometimes he especially incarnates himself as an avatar to carry your luggage. And unlike in the US, it is free. The trolley is not charged. <laughs> Recently saw in Canada, Canada they have made it free. Once upon a time it seems they have charged it. In India everything is free, as you know. In this country you say there is no free lunch. In India there is free lunch is considered as a great act of merit. So it's all free. The Lord comes down to carry your luggage and you, your body. Only he says, please come to me. And then he comes and approaches you. Sir, will you carry your, give me your luggage, I will carry. You want to carry charges? No charges. There is something fundamentally wrong. We can't believe him. <laughs> so we don't believe somebody charge, doesn't charge you. So you carry yourself wherever you go, your karma, your samskaras, your mind, your intellect. Which means, when I feel unhappy being lonely, being in my own company which is inevitable, logically it means that I am unhappy in my company. Anybody contest this? No. I repeat this. When I say I am lonely, unhappy and alone, that means I am unhappy with myself. I don't like my company. Otherwise you would be happy in your company. I look for somebody else's company to make me happy because I don't like myself. Now, if I don't like myself, why should you like me? It's a simple question. See how Vedanta is analyzing the experiences. If I myself don't like myself, why should I expect you to like me? This is fundamental to what is called Ekanta Vasa in Vedanta. Ekanta means alone, Vasa, living by yourself. The so Vedanta says you love your own higher self. Unless you love yourself, why should you expect anybody else to love you? The simple example is that of a child. Look at children. Anybody in this audience who doesn't like children? Every child is so lovely, so cute, so sweet, and so attractive, and so lovable. Why? Because a child doesn't like anybody else's company. I don't know whether you have uh, 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 carefully watched children after becoming monks, one great loss which we feel is the company of children. We don't have children as you know. And children rarely come to the ashramas. And some ashramas say, children not allowed before eight years and so on. Sri Ramakrishna said the Paramahamsas are like children. They always live with children five years old. See, if you like, look at a child playing by himself or herself. If you look at it carefully and go near it, it says, no, don't come near me. I'm playing. Playing with whom? Playing with himself. It lives in a world of imagination, world of uh, his or her own, and extremely contented and happy. Since the child is happy with himself or herself, loving his or her own company, everybody worth his name is running behind the child. So you love yourself, to be loved by others. That's a simple formula. The moment you say, I feel lonely in my company, I don't like my company, 
Don't expect anybody else to like your company. Don't expect that. Why does it happen? We were also children once upon a time. I think it was Wordsworth who wrote a poem, Ode to Childhood. We were children and were so happy. Unfortunately, we grew up. And still more unfortunately, we were educated. Sri Ramakrishna never went to school. There was a school dropout. And most of the geniuses in the world didn't go to school. Ravindranath didn't go to school. Shakespeare didn't attend school. This is not my statement. See, most of the statements I make are not mine. I borrow them from various divine sources. <coughs> but the cooking is mine. <laughs> I cook with some spices <coughs> to make it interesting. Once again, following Swami Vivekananda, who said about the Westerners, I want to give them hard, dry reason, softened in the sweetest syrup of love, made spicy with work, and cooked in the kitchen of yoga, so that even a baby can easily digest it. <laughs> it was so much his language. It was Swami Vivekananda who said, My master was a simple child of nature. He learned everything from nature, living most naturally as a child. <coughs> so when we grew up, we learned so much of sophistry through education, how to behave, how to say yes and no. When you don't like anybody, you say, Oh, how much I like you, and with a broad smile which you don't mean. How to be hypocritical. All that we learned through education, through what is known as civilization and culture. You have to be cultured, you have to be civilized, you have to smile at people broadly when you don't feel like smiling. Somebody approaches you and says, Ah, I was just expecting you, which is totally false. We do it every day. Don't say that we don't do that. That is called courtesy, that is called manners. What happened to us down the line when we grew up? Let us analyze that. A child is completely absorbed in himself or herself. We can see that happening. Every one of us is born with a huge resource of love, of joy, sweetness, happiness. When we grow up, we begin to invest it in others, in things outside. Let us watch this. When you become a boy or a girl, adolescent, you begin to invest it in your friends. Later on, invest it in your bank balance, in your credit cards, in your Android cell phones, in your laptop computers, in their positions. Hundred thousand investments we begin to make of the huge resource of love which we have, of the happiness which we have. But if you keep investing what you have in hundred thousand sources, what you yourself possess becomes less and less till it becomes empty. When you invest too much outside, you become empty you are no longer attractive. As a child, we were so attractive because we didn't invest in anything. We were just were completely absorbed in ourselves. Is it selfishness? What is selfishness? A distinction is made of self-love and love of the self. It is not juggling with words. Self-love is the love which you have for the lower self. And love of the self is the love which you have for the higher self. You may ask, are there two selves? Vedanta says, till you realize yourself as the one supreme reality called Satchidananda, which you actually are, till you realize that, there are two selves you have to reckon with. The famous mantra in the Mundaka Upanishad. It says in this body which is likened to a tree, two birds are sitting. Dva suparna sayuja sakhaya 
ಸಮಾನಂ ವೃಕ್ಷಂ ಪರಿಷಸ್ವಜಾತೆ ತಯೋರನ್ಯ ಪಿಪ್ಪಲಂ ಸ್ವಾಧ್ವತ್ತಿ ಅನಶ್ನನ್ನನ್ಯೋ ಅಭಿಚಾಕಶೀತಿ ಸಮಾನೇ ವೃಕ್ಷೇ ಪುರುಷೋ ನಿಮಗ್ನ ಅನೀಶಯ ಶೋಚತಿ ಮುಖ್ಯಮಾನ ಜುಷ್ಣೈ ಯದಾ ಪಶ್ಯತ್ಯಂಜಮೇಶಂ ಅಸ್ಯ ಮಹಿಮಾನಮಿತಿ ಭೀತಶೋಕ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಹಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೋ ಗ್ರಾಫಿಕಲಿ ಇನ್ ಇಸ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ಅಮರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸೇಮ್ ಟ್ರೀ ಟೂ ಬರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಗೋಲ್ಡನ್ ಪ್ಲೂಮೇಜ್ ಸಿಟಿಂಗ್ ಒನ್ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ಬರ್ಡ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಬಾಟಮ್ ಕಾನ್ಸ್ಟಂಟ್ಲಿ ಮೂವಿಂಗ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೇರ್ ನಾವು ವಿ ಕಾಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಟ್ವೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಸಿ ಅ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ಬರ್ಡ್ ದೇರ್ ಟ್ವೀಟಿಂಗ್ that bird is constantly eating fruits sometimes sweet fruits sometimes bitter fruits and there's another bird sitting at the top majestic glorious luminous absorbed in its own higher self when the smaller bird eats a particularly bitter fruit it becomes upset and looks at that bird oh how majestic how beautiful how glorious it moves a inches towards that again forgets starts eating the bitter fruits and the sweet fruits once again it eats a very bitter fruit looks at that bird keep moving when it keeps moving inch by inch and almost reaching that bird suddenly it is overpowered by the luminosity and the glory of the upper bird and looks at itself looks at the bird oh i was all the time the upper bird unfortunately through ignorance through agyana i thought of myself as a small little bird suffering enjoying eating bitter and sweet fruits there is only one bird all the time that is the explanation which swami vivekananda gave of this famous mantra so there are two selves within you one is the lower self which in the vedantic parlance all of you are now <coughs> initiated in the vedanta sufficiently to be able to follow this the annamaya pranamaya manomaya always keep this panchakosha paradigm in mind upanishad doesn't talk about the kosha anymore the word kosha was introduced by shankara for a specific advaitic purpose of establishing his philosophy the upanishad first say in the text says annamaya atma pranamaya atma manomaya atma vigyanamaya atma and anandamaya atma the concept atma individual selves autonomous themselves so the annamaya pranamaya manomaya together is a lower self then when you come to the vigyanamaya you awaken to a higher self this is the meaning of the famous gayatri mantra which is perhaps one of the most sacred of the mantras of the hindus which is given to a child when it goes to school <coughs> awaken the dhi dhiyo yo na prachodayat within you by which you will be able to intuit yourself as a self as a spirit living in the body you are not the body but you are a spirit in the body you call it dehi or a shariri the person living in this body so annamaya pranamaya manomaya together form the lower self and from the vigyanamaya you awaken your higher spiritual nature when you awaken to this nature something very strange happens to you this has been recorded by the saints and sages i will recommend a book to you by swami yatishwarananda adventures in religious life it's a remarkable book these people wrote out of the, their own realization there's a chapter there secret stairs to super consciousness <laughs> so the secret stairs to super consciousness you discover when you come to the vigyanamaya you first realize there is a luminous path which is opening up in which you can move and see your higher being as the infinite and the absolute you who thought of yourself as a small limited entity constantly suffering smiling and laughing at some time and crying and weeping at some other time 
are not that limited entity anymore. What is life? Life has been described in a sentence. It's a pendulum oscillating between a smile and a tear. We keep on moving. But we are not unhappy about it. When we talk about all this, some people say, Swami, you people, the monks, exaggerate things a little too much. Life is not that bad. Of course we are suffering. Of course we are unhappy. But we have patches of joy. Don't exaggerate beyond a point. The answer to them is, please go ahead. Life will take you forward. Smile, cry, weep, be happy. When you are tired of it, you come to Vedanta. This is what Vekananda said. One of his disciples told him, I think life is a huge stage in which we are all actors who come to act, quoting from Shakespeare. Swamiji smiled and said, but madam, I think slightly differently. It's a huge circus in which we are clowns who come to tumble down. They were so flabbergasted. Swami, why do we tumble down? He said, because madam, we like tumbling down. And when you are tired of it, we quit. All the tumblings we do, even in Vedanta, all of us are tumbling in this hall now. We meditate, we do puja, we go for work. All the various activities are a series of tumblings down. <laughs> Ultimately, there is no meaning in all the things that you do in the relative world. The only meaning is that all these things are informed and permeated by the divine presence. We don't realize it at the moment and think it is only an imagination. As Vivekananda also was challenged once. Swami, you are trying to hypnotize us. We feel and realize we are small, we are limited, we are suffering. We are full of pain and you say there is no pain, there is no suffering. No, it can't be. We are hypnotizing ourselves into thinking that we are not this small body. Which we are. Then Swamiji smiled and said, exactly the opposite, madam. I am dehypnotizing you. You have been hypnotized into thinking that you are limited and small. I am dehypnotizing you into realizing that you are the infinite self. So he defined Vedanta as a science of dehypnotization. When you come to the Vijnanamaya, men of realization say that a new world opens up to you. It is called Dhi, it is called Medha, it is called Prajna in uh, Yoga Sutra, the Prajna Loka, the light of Prajna. They call it Ritambhara Prajna, the truths bearing Prajna. And it is also called Buddhi, not the intellect which we talk about normally, but the intelligence which is beyond the intellect, which is intuitive faculty. You suddenly open up to a new world of light. Sri Ramakrishna experiences this and then records it. Says when the Kundalini reaches the heart, which is the Vijnanamaya, suddenly you see an uncreated light. And said, what is this? What is this? And then you feel that this light is you. In that light of consciousness, you see the entire world in a different perspective. You see yourself in a different perspective. <clears throat> then you begin to ask and crave for a different dimension of reality. It's only the spirit which can love the spirit. When we say we love somebody, it is not because of flesh, it is not because of money, it is not because of anything else. It is because the spirit living in that person. Only a spirit can love the spirit. A couple of days ago we discussed it. My dear me in the Upanishad. The Bharatarnika Upanishad. Atmanastu kamaya sarvam priyam bhavati. It is because of the self, the Atman, the spirit which everything becomes so dear to us. 
न वा अरे पत्युक कामाय पति प्रयोग भवत्यात्मनस्तु कामाय पति प्रयोग भवति न वा अरे जाया ये कामाय जाया प्रिया भवत्यात्मनस्तु कामाय जाया प्रिया भवति न वा अरे सर्वस्य कामाय सर्वं प्रियं भवत्यात्मनस्तु कामाय सर्वं प्रियं भवति आत्मा वा अरे दृष्टव्य श्रोतव्यो मंतव्यो निदिध्यासि दव्या हाँ या केवल क्या टीच इस मैत्री it is for the sake of the self that everything becomes dear to you. This self, this Atman, has to be realized and seen through listening about it from the Acharya, from the element of soul, from the scriptures, Shastra and Acharya, meditating upon it deeply, contemplating upon it, and getting absorbed into it through Nididhyasana or Samadhi. Everything becomes dear to you only because of your own self. So this idea appears to be very strange and new to us because we are still caught up in the Annamaya, Pranamaya and the Manomaya, the lower bird, the lower self. When you awaken to the higher self from Vijnanamaya and move on thereafter to Ananda and beyond, men of realization say, they have recorded that you first feel yourself to be the self, the Atman, living in the body. Then a tremendous urge arises in you to get united with the Supreme Self, the whole world of experience, and see all people around you as your own selves. That comes at the last stage, but the awakening begins at the Vijnanamaya level. When you realize it with the spirit, the whole world of spirit opens to you, you begin to see others also as the spirit. Swami Vivekananda writes in a letter to Kidi, his dear disciple, it is our duty to think upon ourselves as souls, as spirits, and to think and treat all others also as spirits. So the entire interpersonal relationship is transformed. You no longer relate to people through money, through flesh, through position, but you relate to them as spirit relating to the spirit. Carnality completely vanishes and you awaken to your spiritual consciousness in which you want to realize the other people also as spirit which you yourself are. Now when this happens, you long to get united with your higher self. This is what is defined by Shankara, the great Advaitic Acharya, as Bhakti. Shankara's definition of Bhakti is very interesting in the Viveka Chodamana, he says, Svasvarupa Anusandhanam Bhaktiritya Bhidiyate Deep inquiry, longing to know your real spiritual nature is Bhakti. When does it come? When you realize there is a spirit living in the body, I mentioned it last time, but you realize that you are hopelessly caught in this body and the material things. You are tied to this matter through your knot, K-N-O-T, which is knot, N-A-U-G-H-T. <laughs> Vedanta says that knot is actually not, but we really, we think it is true, but you realize you are caught hopelessly. Vedanta says your whole spiritual sadhana begins from that point you realize you are hopelessly caught in this body and the mind. You no longer rejoice in the pleasures of the body-mind, which you were doing till the other day. When this awakening takes place, you say, oh, I am caught now. Suppose you are in a prison cell without knowing that you are there, and you are given all good things to eat and to enjoy. Then suddenly you see, I am in a prison. Whatever be the enjoyment I go through, I am a slave, I am a prisoner. Then you say, no, I have to get out of this. Swami Vivekananda mentions in a letter to Navidita, 
We are all caught in a trap. The sooner we escape, the better. Some people have called Vedantas escapists. I want to escape. Of course, we are escapists. I want to escape from this prison of the body and the mind. And slaves and prisoners who want to be there, continue there in the prison, happily. Let them think of themselves as non-escapists and continue. But I will not continue anymore. So when that becomes extremely powerful, that urge, Vedanta describes it as your hair getting on, catching fire. That's why monks have shaved in ha hairs. <laughs> <laughs> because hairs. <laughs> and people have longish hairs. And they're very proud of it. Oh, look at my hair. When it catches fire, and you are rushing to a lake to put it out, in a source of water, somebody tells you, oh, you have wonderful uh, rasagulla here to eat. Come on, you did cake. My hair is on fire. Cake, cake, what can I eat? So that kind of urge comes to you. Vedanta talks about this. You can't rest content anymore. You can't live in this world of relativity anymore. You want somehow to get out of this. But you try to get out, but you are caught again. Why? This knot is there. It's called Chit Jada Granthi. Chit is Chaitanya consciousness. Jada is matter. Chit and Jada are inextricably tied together through this knot. Cutting this Gaudium knot is necessary. Before that you realize you are caught. Vedanta says first you realize, are you aware that you are hopelessly caught in this matter? No, we are not. We are happy. But please be happy. I am not saying that you should be unhappy. But you when you realize this, you can't be happy anymore. You say, now somehow I have to get rid of this. Then you go to a guru, Sadguru, a man of realization, and then fall prostrate, please save me from this. Pariksha Lokan Karma Chitan Brahmano Nirveda Maya Nasta Krita Kritena Tadivigyana Artham Saguru Meva Vigache Samit Panish Rutriam Brahmanishtam Mundakopanishad. Then, after having examined all the worlds and having found out this can't give you lasting happiness because the whole thing is based on karma. You do this, you get some result. You go round and round. This can't release you. Then you rush to your guru and the characteristics of the guru are mentioned in the Vedanta. He will be a Shrotriya, man who is well versed in the Shastras, which are the documented versions of men of realization. Brahmanishta, here Brahma means the Vedas. You are devoted to knowledge constantly in your life. And he is apap akamahata. He is not smitten by small desires. Avrijana, he is sinless. And lastly, and most importantly, is Paramakarunika. He is extremely compassionate. He looks at you and says, Oh, my child, you are suffering so much. Swami Brahmananda Ji, if you read the eternal companion, sometimes he says, Please, please, I plead with you, try this spiritual life. What great joy it is. Try for three years and come and slap me if you don't get anything. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I fall down at your feet. I plead and request you, please see how great is the spiritual joy that you can derive from going inward. Because these great men who see us in bondage and realize themselves to be free feel so sad that we are all caught here so sadly. At that point of time, you long to the, keep the company of your own higher self. This is where loneliness goes away. I realize myself as a spirit in the body and I realize that I can keep the company of my own higher self. People like Ramana Maharshi and other men of realization have said, you as it were, go and fall into the lap of the higher self. That's the idiom which is used, just like a tired and famished and um, worn out child comes and falls in the lap of the mother. 
Mom, I can't take it anymore. And the mom carries this and elevates it. In exactly the same way, the language which is used is, the higher self, the Atman, as it were, takes you in, in your lap. And then you long to keep the company of your own higher self. When you realize the higher self is the source of all joy, all happiness, all bliss, all wisdom, where will you go, leaving your own higher self? The higher self has been waiting for you for eternity, year after year. Please come, my child, you are you roaming around here and there. When you realize that higher self, you call it God, you call it the Guru, you call it Ishwara, you call it the Atman, all of them are synonymous. Ishwaro Guru Ratmeti Murti Bheda Vibhagine Nakshinamurti Stotra says Ishwara Guru Atman Grace the heart all of them are synonymous. So he takes you in your lap. Then you long for your own company. You don't feel lonely anymore. You enjoy being alone. This is called a state of Atma Arama. It's a beautiful word in Sanskrit, in Vedanta. Arama means relaxation. You relax. Where? You relax in your own Atman. Atma Arama. The words which are used are very significant. Atma prano heshaya sarva bhutair vibhati vijanan vidvan bhavate nadivadi atma kreda atparati kriyavan esha brahma vidam varishtaha Varishta is the supreme knower of Brahman. Brahmavidam Varishta, the Vedanta talks about different gradations in Brahmavid also. Brahmavid, Brahmavid Variya, Brahmavid Variyan, and Brahmavid Varishta, the supreme knower of Brahman. Who is he? His Atma Krida, Atma Rati. He sports and delights in himself, Atma Krida. Atmarata, he is absorbed in himself and finds light in himself. He is Atma Arama, he relaxes in himself. He is Atma Tushta, he is satisfied with himself. And he is Atma Priya, who finds himself a man of great joy. I got this name, but I should somehow realize the significance of this name. Swami Tapasyananda was a very great monk of our order who was the vice president who <coughs> was my intellectual mentor for nearly two decades. I used to be very free with him. I told him, Oh Swami, what a beautiful name Mahapurush Swami Shivananda gave you, Tapasyananda. Then he smiled and said, He gave me something which I lacked so that I should do more Tapasya. We all get names because the name inspires you to realize the truth behind that name. Just be content with yourself. Apunate apuni te kumon jeonamon karo ghare ja chabita boshe pavi khojo nijo Antapure. Sri Ramakrishna was very fond of this song. Oh mind, why do you run about here and there? Whatever you want, you will get within. Die within you. Just stay put with yourself. In English we call it staying put. All that Vedanta says, you should become stay put ananda. <laughs> Atma priyananda means stay put ananda. <laughs> because we translate everything in English. Now here you have to sing the, English, the Vedantic songs in English. So stay put joy. <laughs> Just stay put with yourself. Don't run here and there. Whatever you need, whatever you seek, whatever you want is just there here in your own heart. So Vedanta repeatedly says, turn the entire focus on your own self. The higher self. But unfortunately, we don't have the time, energy or the inclination. Because we are so much lost in the outside world. After this smartphones have come, this, is, this task has become much harder. 
The phone is the phone is extremely smart, take you away from yourself. Continuously you can see people playing with this. Wherever you people don't have the time to talk to others, they can't even smile at others. If they greet somebody, they have a very artificial smile. <laughs> Keep on. There's no end to this. See, you realize, see, our, our time is very limited. Did I tell you the calculation of time which I made? We'll quickly go through that. Suppose you live for 90 years. Shall I put it 90, reasonably? 120, no. <laughs> Suppose we live for 90 years. And we sleep for 8 hours in a day, which is one third. 30 hours goes in sleep. Simple. So we have 60 years now. How much time you spend in a day to uh, clean your teeth, take baths and make up and all that? So two to three hours or, or more. So if it is um, one, one, one eighth of your life, let's say 10, 15 years go there. So you have 45 years left. When you are a child, up to 10 or 12 years you know, you know nothing practically, you have to depend hopelessly on your parents. And at the end of your life, after 80, 85, you are also helpless. So you can say nearly 15 years ago. So you have 30 years left now. And we get hopelessly educated for 20, 25 years. <laughs> so hardly you have five years left for Vedanta. So Vedanta says, when do we begin this exercise of Vedanta? Now, at 11.50, in this hall in Hollywood. There's no time left. That's why the great uh, Shankara, once again, we were chanting it yesterday when we came in the car with Swami Mahayogananda. He says, with great pathos, he prays to Shiva. Ayuranashyadipashyatam pratidinam yadikshayam yauvanam Pratyayantigata punar nadivasa kalo jagad bhakshaka Lakshmi stoya taranga bhanga chapada vidyut chalam jivitam Tasman maam sharanagatam sharanada tvam raksha raksha adhuna Oh Lord, please save me, save me adhuna, now you save me. Because life is going away, life, time is fleeing past. And I am aging every moment. And the day which is gone will never come back again. 20th of October 2017 will never come back again. And every moment my youth is fading away. I was young, energetic, so handsome. I look myself in the mirror and say, oh, how beautiful I am. <laughs> After 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, hey, what has happened to you? Your hair, your hair has gone gray and all your teeth has fallen down and you have to move with a stick. Shankara describes old age so graphically. Angam galitam palitam mundam dashana vihinam jatam tundam pruddho yate grihitva dandam tadavina munchati asha pindam the Bhajagavindam song. The whole body has become so weak and your hair has gone grey. All your teeth have fallen down and you have to totter with a stick. Where is the time? That's why Swami Vivekananda once wrote here in a letter. I only preach awake, 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 awake. Wake up now. Already much time is lost. I'm not trying to frighten you. I, I tell myself all the time. Where is the time? Time is just ebbing out. Nobody will come to your rescue when you pass away. You have to be alone with all your karma. So make friendship with your higher self. Constantly talk to your higher self, which is God, which is Guru, whoever. And then SMS your higher self. Text your higher self. Tweet your higher self. Email your higher self. Higher self at gmail.com. <laughs> G, G is for God. So this is what great saints have done. They constantly keep talking to themselves. You can see many of the sadhakas, saints, aspirants all over the world, 
they talk to their higher mind. Sadhana karna chahiye manuva, bhajana karna chahiye manuva, bhajana karna chahiye manuva. Oh mind, do sadhana, to call on God. It is calling up the higher self to awaken. Kamala Kanta, Ramprasad, Majlo Amar Manu Brahmara, Shama Padanil Kamale. Oh mind, call on the mother. Why the mind is addressed? Because the higher self has to be made your own friend. This is a very important technique in spiritual sadhana. Have friendship with your higher mind. Talk to it. Don't coerce it. It will revolt. You talk to it because the higher self is your friend. The Gita talks about in the sixth chapter. Uddhared atman atmanam natmanam avasadayet atmai vakhyatmano bandhur atmai varupura atmanaha Save yourself by save yourself. Raise yourself by yourself. Do not demean yourself. You are your own friend and you are your own enemy. That means the higher self should be your friend and if you detach from the higher self, close the channel which opens up to the higher self, then you become your own enemy. Nobody is going to save you. The savior, which is the higher self or God, is within you and therefore try to keep the company of the holy, which is your own self. Because the holy men may not be around you all the time. So Mi Ashokananda very funnily says, we may need the company of holy men, but the problem is whether the holy men want our company. Ramakrishna, <laughs> Swami Brahmananda was very particular. When they saw people around, worldly people, they used to run away. So try to keep your own, the company of your own higher self. Make it a habit. At least sit apart some time in the day so that you can be just alone by yourself. It's become so difficult now. We were discussing that yesterday. Suppose you give a kind of uh, sadhana to people. No cell phones, no laptops, no internet available. At least for a week you should be by yourself. People go mad. Solitary confinement is the worst punishment which is given to a criminal. Do you know that? Why? Because he has not developed the habit of keeping his own company. So the Atma Rama idea in Vedanta, Atma Rama, Atma Tripta, Atma Krida, Atma Ratha, Atma Priya, Atma Tushta, so many words are used. The idea that you should delight in your own higher self, which is aloneness, Ekanta Vasa. As contrasted with, as contradistinguished with loneliness. Loneliness kills you because you feel that nobody is there for you. Then you realize the higher bird is there for you, looking at you and trying to grace you. Once you realize that, you become so calm, you keep your own company. What happens? Everybody rushes to you. Because you are loved by everybody. What is the deepest, most urge in the human heart? To be loved and to love. That I am not loved by anybody. Nobody likes me. Nobody wants me. It's such a tremendous agony. You will be liked by everybody, loved by everybody, when you love your own higher self. Why do people run to Sri Ramakrishna? Because it's just absorbed in his own higher self. Because you, in that situation, in that position, <laughs> Send out currents of love to everybody because you unite with everybody else. Your higher self is united to everybody else. The Gita says, Yo maam pashyati sarvatra sarvam chami pashyati tasyaham na pranashyami suchame na pranashyati sarvabhuta sthitam yo maam bhajat ekatvam asthitah sarvatha vartamano pi sayogi mai vartate he who sees me in every being and every being in me and worships me through ekatva is a very profound verse. Bhajati ekatva masthitaha. Bhajati worships me. How ekatva masthita established in oneness. That means you realize yourself and you realize how Brahmasmi, I am the Supreme Spirit, then he becomes all. There is a beautiful statement in Brihadaranyaka Parishat. 
1.4.19 in which it is said Brahmava idamagra asit tadatmana meva avet aham brahmasmi iti tasmat sarvam abhavat Agrai, Agrai, in the beginning, the Brahman alone existed. The individual self existed as Brahman, or Brahman existed as the individual self. It realized itself as Aham Brahmasmi, I am the Supreme Spirit. Then what happened? Tasmat Sarvam Abhavati, he became the All. When you realize yourself as the Supreme Spirit, and you lapse into it, of the supreme compassionate Lord who, re- who is residing in your heart as the supreme spirit then you become the all when you become the all waves of blessing and waves of compassion waves of love proceed from your heart unknowingly and people get attracted to you even if you want that you should be loved by people people should like you people should love you people should get attracted to you the easiest way to do it is realize your higher self. <laughs> That's what the Upanishad says, you will not lose anything in the worldly sense. Mahan Bhavati Prajaya Pashupir Brahmavarcha Sena Mahan Kirtya You will get everything, all the Kirti, all the fame, everything you will get by realizing your higher self. And it is the easiest thing in the world because you don't go anywhere. You don't have to go to the Himalayas, you don't have to go to the forest. It is just you here. Wherever you are, whatever you are, any position, any part of the day, any time, any place, you keep the company of your higher self and delight in that. You become the Atma Rama, Yoga Mahasparasantushta. Second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks the question, who is a Sita Prajna, man of steady wisdom? The Bhagavan defines him in one sentence, Prajahati yada kaman sarvan partha manogatan. A person who completely gives up all the desires in his mind. There Shankara, the great commentator, raises the question, if we give up all desires, there will be no source of satisfaction. We get satisfied through fulfilling desires. If desires all go away, there will be no source of satisfaction. If there is no source of satisfaction, you become mad. Who is a mad person? A madman is a person who finds no satisfaction in anything. So will he become mad? Unmatta pravrta syad, he says. No, he finds satisfaction. Where? Atmanye eva atmana atushta stita pragnya Atmani eva atmana atushta. He becomes satisfied in his own higher self. The supreme satisfaction, the supreme love and the supreme joy that you get. Priyatva, you become dear to your own higher self, then you become dear to everybody. This is the great message which Vedanta preaches. For the modern world, where loneliness has become a great disease, a rampant disease, lonely, people are unhappy, people are bored, people are lonely. So the antidote to loneliness is to be alone with your own higher self. Awaken the higher self and become friendly because it's your own self. It's not somebody else's. For which you have to struggle hard in the beginning. Swami Brahmananda says, the beginning struggle is a little hard. When you reach the Vijnanamaya, then you awaken to the higher self and realize yourself as that higher self and you open the door to reach the higher self. Walk through that path and you realize you're in a world of light, world of supreme felicity and the world of supreme joy. And Vedanta is inviting all of you in this very hall, where so many great men of realization have spoken, have been there, the vibration is so intense, and the relics of Sri Ramakrishna are all enshrined here. So this Vedanta Society of Southern California is giving you a free invitation into the world of light and spirit of joy. And as Ramakrishna said, Anandir Hat Bhushichi. A market of joy is open to you and this joy is your own higher self. When you delight and relax in that higher self, you get fulfilled in life and all goodness will come, glory will come, 
all this good and grand will come, as Vivekananda said, when the sleeping soul awakens to his supreme activity and joy. Thank you. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnad Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavasishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Panamastu That is infinite and this world of relativity is also infinite. When infinite is taken away from infinite, infinite alone remains. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. Hari Om, that existence. May this entire exercise be an offering unto Sri Ramakrishna, the Supreme Spirit.